check, check. It's working. Just need to turn it up. This one. Don't need to do this.
Well, good morning and welcome to St. John United Church of Christ. No matter who you are or where you are on life's journey, you're welcome here. Just a few announcements before we begin our worship this morning. First, if you're joining us on Facebook Live, we appreciate you saying good morning to one another and leaving a comment for us so we know who all is participating with us virtually. There is a pride event, and I think this year they're going to call it a pride walk, which will begin right at the corner here at Grand and Webster, um, right in front of our church. And as an open and affirming congregation, we really need to show up in force to show that we live what we value and that our open and affirming statement is not just a statement, but it is how we live and accept everyone. So it's on June 25th. <clears throat> the walk begins at 10 a.m. We'll have our fellowship hall open with a variety of resource tables from various organizations and support groups um, in the Defiance area. And there are some other events being planned in and around Defiance for that day. And there is a sign-up sheet in the Narthex. Mary Williams and Fred Coulter are kind of heading up uh, St. John's uh, efforts to support this. So if there's any way you can help out, please sign up in the Narthex. And at a minimum, at least please show up for that event. The Strawberry Festival will be Thursday, June 16th, and again, there is a sign-up sheet in the Narthex to either help and or to donate goods and food for that event. It will be a drive-through event again. We will not be sitting and eating in our fellowship hall, but um, we are increasing the number of meals we will be having since last year. We sold out in about 30 minutes, so um, we'll be increasing our food substantially. There is a blood cross, uh, Red Cross blood drive on Wednesday, June 22nd, right here at the church from 1 to 6 p.m. in the Fellowship Hall. And you can either call the Red Cross or go onto their website to schedule an appointment. And they prefer that you do that. So if you are thinking of giving, please be sure to schedule an appointment. I also wanted to point out that uh, because of what happened this week, there is a change in the readings and in the message from what's in your bulletin, so please pay attention to the screen. So now let us prepare our hearts and our minds for a spirit of worship as Mark plays for us. I invite you to rise in body or in spirit as we center our hearts in worship. Come and see, Jesus is here. Come and worship God. Made known to us through the life, death, and resurrection of Jesus. Come and see, Jesus is calling you. Come and worship the three in one who is in us and around us. Come and worship the living God. Thank you.
Please lift your voices together with mine in the calling upon God. God of righteousness, made known to us through Jesus Christ and the nudging of the Advocate, we know your aspirations for us and all humanity are so often left unfilled. And we come in humility to seek forgiveness for what we have failed to do and what we have done that bore as poor witness to your love and grace. Forgive us, Lord, and walk with us into a new day, reminding us that we are one with you and that it is your and our delight to serve the great commonwealth of glory. Amen. Since there seems to be a little bit of an uptick in the coronavirus, I will refrain from inviting the young and young at heart to come forward and just um, give you the message for the young, young and young at heart from here at a safe distance. In the Bible, uh, Jesus talks a lot about his relationship with God. And primarily, Jesus uses male language for God because that was the norm for his time and age. But really, God is beyond gender. Anyway, Jesus talks a lot about the bond that he has with God. And he often says, especially in the Gospel of John, that they are one. And this is the language that the Gospel of John uses from the very beginning to the very end. So I have some questions for you. What difference do you think it made for Jesus to know that he was loved by God? Do you think it helped the disciples to know that they were loved by Jesus and by God just like God loved Jesus? Yeah. Definitely. Well, Jesus told the disciples that they were to love one another just as he loved them. Now, in a way, that defined them as a group, that they loved one another. Love is the core of Jesus' message. And I think there's something tremendously positive about understanding that that you're part of something bigger than yourself, that you are united in purpose with others. Well, that's how a lot of different groups and, and faith groups operate. They, they understand and they act upon being united in purpose. And that's what we're called to do as a church. A picture on the screen, I don't know if you can see me in the right there with the hard rock t-shirt on. <laughs> That's, that's me with uh, our church youth group when we were on a work trip, um, a work camp in Tennessee. And there were about 400 kids from all over the United States gathered together at this school in Tennessee for a week of work in the middle of July in Tennessee. You can imagine what that was like. But that's really what the church was supposed to be about. It is supposed to be about. It's, it's not even a club. It's not a club at all, even though we talk about membership. A church is supposed to be a movement of people who are committed to follow the way of Jesus, a people who are really committed to live out an eternal life for everyone. Let's pray. Holy and living God, help us to know in our hearts that we are truly loved. Help us to show that love to others, to make them feel your love in their hearts as well. Because love can heal so many things, and it's so desperately needed in our world today. Amen.
What's the time in our worship service where we lift any special joys or concerns that we may have in our hearts or the heart? Things going on in our lives or the things going on in, in uh, people we know and love and care for, just things going on in the world. I'll try to summarize each of those prayers and say, Lord, in your mercy, and ask that you respond, hear our prayer. So are there any special joys or concerns we can lift up this morning? Yes. Um, Friday, we are burying my sister-in-law's ashes, and Saturday we're having her memorial service. I'm hosting her luncheon here, and so um, just so everybody know, and if there's anyone that wants to help me receive the food since it's a potluck, I'd enjoy some so it's Friday and Saturday. Friday and Saturday. <clears throat> um, Becky's sister-in-law um, is um, being cremated, and her ashes will be received on Friday, and there will be a memorial service and with a reception afterwards here at this church. And if there's anyone willing to help Becky on Saturday morning, please see her after the worship service just to help receive the food. It's a potluck, but she may need help setting things out and... Uh, getting things ready. So, Lord, in your mercy. Prayers, prayers of joy for being becoming great-grandparents again. Lord, in your mercy. And her, his mother is still alive and has, is a great-great-grandmother. Lord, in your mercy. Lord, in your mercy. Jan's, Jan's niece, Dawn, who has been struggling with the recovery from a, a, an illness that when she was hospitalized in the ICU, open heart and open heart surgery for a valve, correct? So please continue to lift Dawn in her prayers, in your prayers as she uh, continues her rehabilitation and recovery. Lord, in your mercy. I'd also like to lift up Linda Brumbaugh. Uh, Linda fell last week and fractured a, a vertebrae. Um, she's home and she has a neck brace on and the doctor told her to try to do as much as she can. Um, but please, please continue to hold Linda and Gary in your, prayer, in, our, in your prayers. Lord, in your mercy. And also for Linda Fetter who had a knee replacement and is at home and recovering. Lord, in your mercy. So for the family of Allie Herman, who had been on our prayer list, uh, who passed away, for her family, please lift your prayers, Lord, in your mercy. Also for um, one of Laurel's friends, Jeannie Crampton, who had a knee replacement for her recovery, Lord, in your mercy. And for our own daughter, Mariel, who has recently been hospitalized, struggling with some other health issues, Lord, in your mercy. And for all the families in Uvalde, Texas. Lord, in your mercy. And for this Memorial Day, for all those who have died in war. Lord, in your mercy. So let us spend a few moments in silence lifting these prayers that we have heard, knowing that God hears and knows our deepest joys and our greatest concerns, especially when we struggle to bring them to our lips.
Brother Jesus, you who intercede on our behalf, we bring you our prayers in a spirit of solidarity with you and with your purpose. We pray for our world with so much diversity and difference from desert sands to Arctic glaciers. Life always finds a way. And within that creativity, we are charged with a special responsibility. When we fail to live into that responsibility, putting the profits of multinational companies above the maintenance of crucial habitats, putting our craving for fossil fuels above the health and well-being of life itself, putting our own comfort above the futures of our children and grandchildren. We pray that we might do better, craving an understanding of how the world works and how it might work better, and seeking a unity of purpose that seeks to do no harm. We pray for our community, and for the stresses and worries that are a part of any society, that the compromises our politicians make are ones that bring good, particularly to those who have little and whose stresses and worries are the greatest. We give thanks for all who work to make our communities more compassionate and welcoming, from food banks, to support for asylum seekers. But we also pray for a time when such work is no longer needed and people can live without fear or need. And we pray for our church in a time of great chance and reform, that wise leaders would guide us and where your story of grace and love will not be lost amid the techno waffle of management speak and sloganizing. We pray for ourselves that you would hear our own prayers for people and places known to us as we pray in the way that Jesus taught, saying, Our Father in heaven, hallowed be your name. Your kingdom come, your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us today our daily bread. Forgive us our sins as we forgive those who sin against us. Save us from the time of trial and deliver us from evil. For the kingdom, the power, and the glory are yours now and forever. Amen. St. John United Church of Christ is a church that backs up its thoughts and prayers with action. Action that shows what it means to be the church. And it is through your generosity that we exist to be a living presence here in defiance and across the internet. So we hope that at this time, if you're joining us online, that you'll prepare an envelope to send in your gift or connect with our tithely account as shown on the screen or <clears throat> through the QR code. And for those of you in the sanctuary, we keep our offertory plates at the center entrance to the sanctuary that you can leave either on your way in or on your way out. So give now with generous hearts that people may hear God's word and be helped by the work of this church.
Will you lift your voices? <coughs> Excuse me. <coughs> Would you lift your voices together with mine in the dedication of these gifts to God's work? You have made your name known to us, Lord Jesus, through the stories we share and the life you offered. And we thank you. May we dedicate ourselves this day and every day to living as if we are united to you and your purpose for the world. May we live to bring healing, reconciling, and grace, to be peacemakers and justice seekers, speaking up to the bullies. May we commit to seeking our place in your kingdom. Amen. Will you join me in prayer? Holy God, whose voice is heard in the thunder and in the silence, speak to us now by the power of your Spirit that we may hear your word for us today. In Jesus' name we ask it. Amen. The first reading for this morning is taken from Leviticus chapter 18, verse 21, from the Common English Bible. You must not give any of your children to offer them over to Molech, so that you do not defile your God's name. I am the Lord. The second reading is from Psalm 6, verses 3 through 7, again from the Common English Bible. My whole body is completely terrified, but you, Lord, how long will this last? Come back to me, Lord, deliver me. 
Save me for the sake of your faithful love. No one is going to praise you when they are dead. Who gives you thanks from the grave? I'm worn out from groaning. Every night I drench my bed with tears. I soak my couch all the way through. My vision fails because of my grief. It's weak because of my distress. And the final reading is taken from the Gospel of Matthew, chapter 26, verses 47 through 52, and again from the Common English Bible. <clears throat> While Jesus was speaking, Judas, one of the twelve, came. With him was a large crowd carrying swords and clubs. They had been sent by the chief priests and elders of the people. His betrayer had given them a sign. Arrest the man I kiss. Just then he came to Jesus and said, Hello, Rabbi. Then he kissed him. But Jesus said to him, Friend, do what you came to do. Then they came and grabbed Jesus and arrested him. One of those with whom Jesus, <clears throat> one of those with Jesus, reached for his sword. Striking the high priest's slave, he cut off his ear. Then Jesus said to him, Put the sword back in its place. All those who use the sword will die by the sword. The Holy Spirit breathes into us these words. This is not the sermon I originally prepared for today. In fact, it's based on a sermon I wrote on the Saturday night before December 16th, 2012 which was also not the sermon I had prepared for that Sunday. You see, December 14th, 2012, was the day a deranged man entered the elementary school in Newtown, Connecticut. And now, just a couple weeks after a mass shooting in Buffalo, New York, that claimed the lives of 10 people in the latter part of their life, another mass shooting in another elementary school of children just beginning their life this time in Uvalde, Texas. 19 children between the, the second through fourth grade, two teachers and the shooter. 17 others wounded, including the shooter's grandmother. Now 90% of the students in that school are Hispanic and 81% come from economically disadvantaged homes. Thursday was to be the last day of school. Just as in 2012, the words I prepared for, for Sunday no longer seemed relevant with the heaviness in my heart. I'm not prone to a lot of swearing, but this makes me so angry. The reading from Leviticus references an ancient deity, Molech, associated with the practice of child sacrifice. Back during the time of Sandy Hook, I called upon the people in the congregation to fo focus their initial energy on caring for the children and for the adults impacted by that evil act, both those in Sandy Hook and, and those in our own schools. The immediate need <coughs> was to care for the grieving and those traumatized by the event. There would be time, I thought, to analyze the situation, to come up with solutions, to come up with ways to keep such an event from ever happening again. And then, nothing substantive happened. Thoughts and prayers dissolved into the status quo with no action or legislation following. The can was kicked down the road. It was as if the deaths of 20 kindergartners and first graders, along with six teachers and the shooter's mother, had no meaning or value. It was as if any sense of community responsibility completely vanished behind political bickering and posturing. Even churches seemed to become immune to compassion, turning instead to either developing active shooter plans or even worse, encouraging their congregations to bring their weapons with them wherever they went, even the pulpit. 
Well, not school shootings. A mass shooting in 2016 at a nightclub in Orlando took the lives of 49 people. And in 2018, 60 people killed and over 400 were wounded when a crazed man opened fire with modified semi-automatic weapons on a crowd gathered for a country music festival in Las Vegas. And then on February 14th, Valentine's Day, 2018, a shooter killed 17 people and wounded 17 more at Marjorie Stoneman Douglas High School. Time and again, lots of thoughts and prayers and some hope of action, but nothing, absolutely nothing. I am so angry. Back in 2012, I had taken Friday off like I normally do. And I didn't have a smartphone back then, so I wasn't instantly aware of events going on in the world as I am today. It's a different world now. I was on vacation in Asheville, North Carolina this last week, and on Tuesday I spent the day reading and in preparation for my peace and justice pilgrimage to, Atlanta, to Alabama that I'll be participating in during the middle part of June. And I had turned off my phone so that I could focus on my reading. And when I was finished, I, I turned my phone back on and I quickly scanned my emails and saw one from the Washington Post indicating that there had been another mass shooting at an elementary school. I can't tell you how tired I am of mass shootings, racist anger, divisive grandstanding of our politicians and those hiding behind what they call fair and balanced news, and no real action or follow-up on thoughts and prayers. Christian theologian Miroslav Volf writes, there is something deeply hypocritical about praying for a problem you are unwilling to resolve. Rabbi Mark Asher Goodman writes, in Judaism, if you say a prayer over something, then fail to do the requisite action that follows, like blessing bread and not eating it. It is a bracha levatla, a wasted blessing which is a sinful act. If you pray for victims of gun violence but do nothing, he says, it is a sinful act. While I was on vacation, I also read, while the world watched, a Birmingham bombing comes of age during the civil rights movement, written by Carolyn Maul McKinsey, who narrowly avoided being killed in the bomb blast at the 16th Street Baptist Church in which four of her friends died in 1963. Children killed in a bombing over race. McKenzie quoted from various writings of the Reverend Dr. Martin Luther King Jr., including his, including his book, Where Do We Go From Here, Chaos or Community? King's last book, before his assassination. King's book was to be a message of hope. And yet I fear that instead of going toward community, we are devolving into chaos. A chaos in which everyone feels they must arm themselves out of fear of their neighbor, out of fear of protecting themselves and their possessions, out of fear that there is not enough for everyone. This is not the life God in Christ wants for us. This is not what it means to live in a way in which one loves God with one's entire being and one's neighbor as oneself. This is not being the church. This is not following Jesus. This is not love. As I said back in 2012, I didn't have a smartphone. Laurel and I had spent the day doing everyday things. I slept in a little <clears throat> and then went to Chardon with Laurel for a doctor's appointment to see an orthopedic surgeon about a knee problem I had been having. It had been feeling better, so I, I thought about not even going to the appointment, but Laurel thought I should get it checked out. I'm glad I did because I ended up needing surgery. 
But we went to the doctor's appointment, and we had a nice lunch together and shopped in some of the antique stores in Chardon, as we sometimes did. And we stopped at this really nice grocery store in Chardon, much nicer, a much nicer one than we had in Jefferson. And then we hurried home to put the groceries away, in time for us to take our shift at ringing the bell for the cell phone. I guessed from and he stopped to drop some money in the kettle and and Laurel asked if he was going hunting and he said he was his brother said he had nine kids and it was hard for him to feed all of them there was something about the man who just seemed to not really like the idea of killing something but he said for his brother's family it was a necessity you do what you must do, I replied. He told us to have a good day, but he, he just seemed really distracted and despondent to me as he left. And I had no idea why. I didn't really think much about it until I came home and logged onto my computer to check my emails. 28 dead in an elementary school in Connecticut. 20 children between the ages of 6 and 7 years old, 6 teachers, the shooter, his mother, killed in a hail of gunfire from a man just barely out of his own childhood, armed with two handguns and an assault rifle. And who knows with what mental anguish tormenting his mind. The parallels with the latest shooting have just jarred me. And I wonder, where do we go from here? Well, I went into the living room back then to tell Laurel about Sandy Hook, and the TV was on, and I could tell from the tears streaming down her face that she knew. As we talked about it, a shiver ran down my spine. We had just come back from Chardon, the place where 10 months prior to Sandy Hook, another tormented soul walked into Chardon High School, opening fire on more innocent children. Children. I cried then and I'm crying now because no one, no one should ever have to experience the pain of losing someone in a mass shooting, especially their child. At the time of Sandy Hook, I remember reading multiple Facebook posts and comments against any sort of gun control. Things like, well, if I had been there, I would have blown the guy away before those kids were killed. If only people in the schools had concealed carry permits, they could have stopped, from kill, stopped him from killing all those children. If only there were more guns, the thinking goes. Less people would be killed. If only there were more guns and bullets, the thinking goes. Fewer lives would be lost. There was an armed security guard at the school, and the police were there within minutes. And it's only gotten worse. In March of this year, Governor DeWine approved a new law that the state Congress had passed allowing anyone to carry a concealed weapon without a license or training. The Fraternal Order of Police and the Association of Police Chiefs spoke out against the law. One of the sponsors of the law, Representative Terry Johnson, stated, nowhere in the Second Amendment of the United States Constitution does it say that you have to have training to defend yourself or bear arms. First off, I'm not sure what that says about the definition of a well-organized militia. But let that sink in. You don't have to have any training. You can be 18. And on, I think it's June 17th, K-12 
carry a concealed weapon in Ohio without training. But you can't buy alcohol because an 18-year-old brain is not developed enough to make good judgments. Does that make any sense? Back in 2012, my mind drifted back to my own childhood during the nuclear arms race when the U.S. and the USSR sprinted to build enough nuclear weapons to destroy the world 20 times over because the thinking went, the more nuclear arms we have, the fewer lives will be lost. They called it deterrence through assured mutual destruction, thinking that neither side would pull their guns out, so to speak, if they knew that no one could win. Of course, it would only work if each country was filled with and led by mentally healthy, compassionate people. All those nuclear arms never made me feel safe as we practiced diving under our desks or marching to the school fallout shelter in the basement. I am so tired of the inability of our legislators to take any meaningful action to reduce access to weapons of mass destruction. Legislators who, for the most part, claim to be Christian and pro-life. I am so tired of our legislators passing laws that take away the rights of a woman to govern what happens to her own body, but won't do anything about controlling access to guns designed for only one purpose, to kill people. I haven't ever been a hunter and have no issue with people owning guns for hunting, but I, I remember the days in which a hunting rifle was limited to an eight-round clip. Because seriously, if you need more than eight rounds to kill a defenseless animal, you need to take up a different pastime. There's only one purpose for the kinds of weapons that are so readily available today, and that is for taking human life and in as short of a time as possible without the need to reload. It is fear, irrational fear, stoked by those who make their profits from selling guns and ammunition to people who will rarely, if ever, go out into the woods to feed their family. I am so tired of the hypocrisy of those claiming to be Christian and pro-life, after Sandy Hook, I rarely, rarely changed my sermon for the week because of another shooting. And it was not because I thought that it would not do any good, but because there have been so many shootings. I would have had to change my sermon almost every week. And the worst of which I mentioned earlier. I mean, so far this year, in 2022, there have been 27 reported shootings in kindergarten through 12th grade schools, resulting in 10 deaths and 51 injuries, not including this last one. There have been 212 mass shootings in the United States so far in 2022. Mass shooting defined as the death or injury of four or more people. In 34 states, more people have died from gunshots than in traffic accidents. I can't help but think of Jesus as I contemplate the violence that seems to define life in the United States. I mean, we're nearing Pentecost. It's next week. But I was driven back to think of the image of Jesus in the Garden of Gethsemane with his disciples, surrounded by, an, by armed men ready to take him away prior to his execution. And Judas, Judas, the one to betray him, walked up to Jesus and kissed him, saying, Greetings, Rabbi. And Jesus said to him, Friend, do what you have come to do. And Jesus submitted himself to the armed men without a fight, knowing that even though he would do so, that it would lead to his death. That was neither uncommon nor illegal for people to carry weapons back then. No concealed carry permit required. So one of Jesus' followers pulled out his sword to defend Jesus, striking and slicing off the ear of one of the men who came to take Jesus. 
And Jesus stepped in and stopped him, saying, Put the sword back into its place. All those who use the sword will die by the sword. Put the sword back in its place. All those who use the sword will die by the sword. Where do we go from here? Do we follow Jesus? Or do we succumb to fear and let chaos reign? Well, as we prepare to honor those who have fallen in war on Memorial Day, those who have died by the sword, I challenge you to contemplate the words of Jesus. I ask you to let your thoughts and prayers move you to action to make this world a little closer to the place that God envisioned at creation, a place of unity and love. I beg you, I beg you to bring the word of Christ to life and challenge our country's leaders to pass legislation to put away the sword and also to provide the health care that people need to overcome their fear and their illnesses so everyone can live in love. May the love of God and the peace of Christ and the power of the Holy Spirit be with you this day and always. Amen. Will you join with me in praying the prayer as shown on the screen? God of compassion and love, we cry out to you as so many before us saying, how long? How long before we take your love to heart and find the courage to demand change? How long will we wring our hands, help, helplessly wring our hands while our children die? How long, O oh Lord? How long? Help us to see that the power is in our hands. Help us to harness our anger and fears to do the work necessary to demand change. It is a complicated situation requiring reassessment of our healthcare systems, our education systems, our laws, our understanding of our United States Constitution. Fill us with the power of your spirit that we may rise up and work for the change needed to stop the unnecessary deaths of our children of every age. Amen.
On the communion table are, is a tray of 22 candles representing the 19 children killed and the two teachers and the shooter. Pray for us, Jesus, that we may be one, your team, your friends, your followers. Stay with us, Jesus, as we stay with you. Be within us, be around us, be among us, today and always. Our worship has ended. <laughs>